attention to what is pain in our elite athletes, how do we manage it, because um, I think this is missed a lot. We talk a lot about injury prevention and risk reduction, but oftentimes we don't talk about your athlete that just walks in and their hips flared up and sore for the day, or they've got a chronic knee problem. That, that's a big piece of the population that we deal with. It can't all be acute injury prevention. Um, so to start here, we're gonna go through a little bit of just kind of modern pain science and what the changes have been over the last 10 years. This is an evolving field. Uh, and then move forward into what we're doing now and how this pain science applies. So first we need to define pain. So pain's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage, which is an important note there. So pain and nociception, which is what people often think of pain as just a signal from a nerve, are distinctly different in the brain. Um, so the old model was that you know, you stick your foot in the fire and all of a sudden you have pain. Your foot tells your brain that there's pain. Uh, this model is from Descartes and it's about 400 years old. And for about 400 years, this didn't change. Um, we've learned now that the nervous system works much more closely to an alarm system. So when you stick your foot in that fire, when you step on a nail, turn your ankle, that there's multiple nerve signals that travel up to your brain and then pain turns into an output. I was hoping that picture was gonna be bigger. Um, so there's ascending pathways regarding pain and descending pathways regarding pain. I think this quote here is fantastic, that a painful sensation occurs following a complex interaction of homeostatic systems in the body providing information to the brain. Simply, there's a lot of stuff going on before pain is given as an output. So a simpler model is much closer to here. So we have that sensory input from the body that previously we looked at as pain, which is stepping on the nail, turning your ankle. But we also have, what is your prior experience? Do you have chronic ankle instability? Uh, what are the factors going into that culturally? Are you in the middle of a game? Are you able, is your body able to perceive that pain right now? Or do they deal with it later? We've all had the athlete who says they turn their ankle, they say they're fine when they're playing, and then two or three hours later, their ankle's swollen, painful, and they are perceiving that much more. So that all goes into it, um, and we often forget that. And the body's really asking, how dangerous is this, and how dangerous is this right now? So that output is pain. There's some descending pathways for pain modulation as well. So endogenous opioid release isn't to downregulate pain coming from the nerve, but is instead to decrease nervous system signals to the brain. So we can... Uh, decrease that signaling and ultimately decrease pain perception, particularly in our athletes that have a higher pain tolerance. Like we've seen this study after study. Some of that's because their movement strategies. Uh, some of that's because they are healthy and well and that changes a great bit as well. So in a normal injury curve, if we're gonna talk about normal injury versus chronic, uh, a normal injury curve looks like this. So this is this first red section here uh, with the black line is pain and the blue line is predicted recovery. Um, initially, there's a great deal of pain right after an injury happens, right? Despite that that tissue damage may not be present as much as an athlete's perceiving it as. This is your guy who turns an ankle, jumps around, freaks out for 30 seconds and goes, oh, I'm fine, right? That's what's happening right there. Their body's perceiving a high level threat, producing pain when there's actually not a ton of tissue damage. Now, as they move forward, that threat level decreases so pain starts to come down as the body's healing. Eventually, the threat gets below what the tissue damage is. This is when, you know, you think about your SNC, your physios, athletic trainers, return to play is so important because their ankle may still be unstable because they haven't scarred down, they haven't healed all the way, but they're not having pain, so they think they should be back on the floor right now. Uh, so just to have kind of that baseline understanding, that's what's normal. And then eventually both of these get back to baseline, your athlete goes on and does well from there. Well, chronic pain works very differently. And there's been a lot of money, uh, actually the Australians have pioneered a lot of this research uh, because of how expensive chronic pain is on the general medical system, not just our athletes. Chronic pain is defined as pain lasting greater than three months, which I think sometimes is unfair. Uh, that's why I like the second definition a little bit more. It's lasting exceptionally longer than the anticipated tissue healing recovery timeframe. So if you have a minor muscle sprain, pain lasting two months much more qualifies as chronic as opposed to waiting to that third month saying, like, oh, now it's chronic, because that was supposed to heal 
way faster than two months down the road. So in chronic pain, some crazy stuff happens in the body. Uh, there's a bunch of neurophysiological changes that happen, and hopefully this pops some athletes into your mind as we go through, but their mechanical sensitivity changes, uh, their behavioral sensitivity changes, so they end up having anxiety, depression. You see stress syndromes coming out a lot more in these athletes. Thermal sensitivity, so hot, cold. Some of these athletes are gonna have chronic injuries, chronic pain. You're not gonna be able to get into the cold tub or the hot tub because they're gonna perceive it much differently than what it actually is. A big concept inside of chronic pain is the concept of central sensitization. This is, uh, so if we look at the curve here on the right is your normal stimulus, right? So it's normally, if you punch somebody on the arm, it's some stimulus, it probably doesn't create a great deal of pain in the brain, but when you've had chronic pain, there's a concept of central sensitization that that curve shifts down the x-axis, and now that punch feels like they're getting hit with a rock, right? And this is, this is very real, they can measure it. Um, a lot of it's been done with thermal sensitivity testing, so poking somebody with a cold object and asking them how cold it really is, and people with chronic pain, they perceive it much colder than it actually is. So in that, with chronic pain, with this centrally sensitized patient, your injury graph starts to look like this, where again, blue line is kind of your anticipated recovery, and it charts normally, right? Their body's still healing. Ligaments are healing, muscles are healing, they're getting stronger, but pain stays extraordinarily high. Some of this can be because of overuse, inflammation, but a lot of it is that central sensitization. As the body's nervous system is just very, very ramped up and can't calm down to get back to the normal level. So that's kind of the, the quick 10 minute spiel on where pain science is now. Um, there's probably some questions, anything Somebody wants to pop up right now, or we can talk about it over a beer later, but good. So we'll talk, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of PTs that aren't really jumping on with like the BPS model. They're yes. still kind of clinging to that classic like Jonda biomechanical model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, why do you think there's this gap in, in shifting yeah. that community? I think it's hard to understand. I think some of it is, it makes sense that if I, kick you in the ankle, that that pain is what's occurring. It's a lot harder to understand that, you know, there's neurophysiology going on that we can't see um, that's producing pain as an output. And I think for a lot of people it gets, whenever you undermine somebody's ideas, there's a resistance to change. Um, hopefully it's shifting, right? Like you mentioned the Yonda model, and we can talk a little bit about it, but like what Peter O'Sullivan's doing, Lormir Mosley, Adrian Lowe, there are guys out there pioneering it, and I think we're going to see it shift in the general population before we see it shift in sports med. Uh, so then we'll talk a couple of classification systems um, to try and get into some more. The first one is from Keith Smart. This was a group out of the UK. They looked at 400, almost 500 patients uh, with low back pain and then plus or minus leg pain, which is an important uh, kind of delineation here, and there's a reason they included them. They tried to categorize them into three groups. So a nociceptive dominant, peripheral neuropathic dominant, and a centrally sensitized dominant pain group. Of course, we know our athletes don't fit in buckets. One of the exclusion criteria for the study was anybody that kind of presented as a blended patient or fell into multiple boxes. They removed them from the study and from the uh, analysis. So the first one, this nociceptive dominant uh, classification it's pain that primarily arises from stimulus to peripheral neurons by mechanical, chemical, and thermal stress. This makes sense, right? This is kind of what we were talking about. This is a very classic model of pain. You turn an ankle, it hurts. So the pain behavior, it's localized to the injured area, it's sharp, intermittent, and most importantly, it has predictive and proportionate aggravating and easing factors. So in an ankle sprain, plantar flexion inversion is gonna to continue to hurt, elevation and rest is gonna feel better and ease it. The second one is a peripheral neuropathic classification. Uh, this is pain arising from damage or dysfunction of the nervous system. So if we think uh, like a peripheral nerve injury, a crush injury, this presents in a dermatonal or cutaneous distribution for the pain. So these are your athletes that say, ah, it kind of hurts here, right? It's much less specific than my bicep tendon hurts every time I flex my shoulder. Uh, this, is, this is important, and then you also want to get into your muscle testing here as well, because there may be a muscle weakness distribution that lines up with this as well. How we test for these is going to be your movement provocative tests, so 
like an upper limb tension test, a straight leg raise to tension that nerve, so selective tissue tensioning, uh, to try and tease this out. The final one which we talked about is that centrally sensitized patient where you know, they previously had a shoulder injury, now their entire shoulder hurts, their chest hurts, their thoracic spine hurts. Um, so it's diffuse non-anatomical areas of pain and tenderness. So you can't quite add up what it is. It seems like it's a million areas, but really it's their central nervous systems driving this pain. And if we wanted to get really nerdy, there's kind of some what they call homunculus smudging, where the brain's map of itself uh, doesn't add up anymore. So the body's not even sure where it is in space and time. And then if we move back to those pain graphs, this is essentially overlaying that. If we pull out the nociceptive pain, right, as that tissue heals, this is that continued one. And it's due to that peripheral neuropathic and centrally sensitized pain generators, uh, leading your athletes to have chronic pain and long-term pain. The next piece is this pain and movement reasoning model. This is out of uh, Australia, Jones, and I don't know. I can't remember the other author. This model's great for pro sports uh, or elite athletes, military. There's not necessarily a differentiation of like, this is peripheral nerve pain, this is nociceptive pain. It just says pain occurs. What are the contributing factors that lead to a load or a stimulus to the nervous system? So this person is perceiving pain. There's three major factors. There's CNS modulation, regional influences, and local stimulation. We'll kind of go through each one of those. So the CNS modulation is kind of the more complex part. This is your patient's beliefs, your patient's social situation, general health. We know that people that are less healthy, have poor diets, sleep less, oftentimes have more pain. And we see, like, we see that in our athletes. We see that in the military population a great deal too. If they have previous trauma, PTSD, um, that deals with their pain perception. Um, the next section here is regional influence. This is some of Yonda's work, kind of the regional interdependence model. So, you know, does weakness, pain, limited mobility at one area lead to an increased stress, ultimately stimulating nerves earlier at another area? Classic one in a baseball player, you know, limited thoracic mobility leads to shoulder and elbow pain due to that limitation in motion. So you get an overload at the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand uh, from one segment not working appropriately. Finally is local stimulation. I don't, I don't want to kill this one, right? This just is pain that makes the most sense, right? Damage to a tissue leads to nerve stimulation, uh, leads to pain perception from the brain. If you got nothing else from that, which is a lot of information if you're not medical, <laughs> uh, pain's extremely complex and is an output from the brain. So when you're going back to your physios, your strength coaches, your medical directors, PAs, talk to them about this stuff, see if you can't get them on board. If you need to email me, shoot me something, uh, and I can give you some nerd articles for them that will help to move this forward because I think we're missing a big piece in our professional athletes just accepting that pain is biomechanical. It is Yonda's model. It's Descartes from 1600. Like I hope we've moved, we've moved well past that. Uh -huh. So the next section is how do we how do we apply those new concepts to stuff we're already doing and why? Um, so the first one here is just some player load monitoring. Uh, this is from the training load model from uh, a couple articles ago. But we're, we're measuring all of this right now. Um, we get this all, we think this makes sense towards injury prevention, but how does this stuff make sense towards injury or management of chronic injury? I think that's where we fall into this acute to chronic workload ratio uh, by Gabbitt. This is one of my favorite graphs I've ever seen because I don't think it just applies in sports science. I think this applies kind of in your return to play criteria, in your management strategies of athletes, in overload strength and conditioning stuff. You want to you live here. You never want to push your guys too far and get up to that kind of 1.5 and up number, but at the same time, we don't want to decondition. That said, I love this graph, but it definitely doesn't tell the whole story. And I think some groups are moving too far towards that, that this is everything. But there's a lot that goes into it, like the coupling or uncoupling of the uh, formula that goes into it. What is the appropriate time frame? A lot of the work is done as one week to four weeks. But we've got uh, a guy here working in baseball. I'm in basketball. Does that make sense for us who are playing three to six games a week at times? Like that's probably not the most sensible ratio for us. And there's no research to tell us what it is. And then time frame in the season, I think, is another important caveat here. Uh, 
as guys are coming out of the season, we want our players to have a zero. I want my guys to leave for two or three weeks, get out, don't load the system, don't come in. But at the same time in preseason, I want to, I'm gonna try and stretch this number. Like our motto is going to be to stretch kind of that 1.3 and push what we feel like we can get in performance games. Everybody here I assume is familiar with us. Any questions? Uh, the next one is kind of movement screening. This falls back into that regional influence and local stimulation. Uh, the goal is to effectively manage load at any segment or muscle in the body. Again, you're doing that right now through like your functional movement testing, whether it's FMS, Y balance, whatever. On the lower end, some people I'm sure are using uh, the Fusionetics. That's another kind of one of those quick, easy movement screens. But then we can get into some drop jump analysis, stop jump analysis, and on the higher end, force plates, 3D motion capture. So if we're having an athlete who's having chronic pain, we need to think, okay, now we're filling in the regional influence and local influence uh, to what their pain perception is, but we still haven't necessarily addressed that CNS modulation. So if you're doing all of this and your athletes aren't getting better, the question is why, right? What are we missing with this? This is great. I'm a numbers guy, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. We're still maybe missing a piece here. Some of that may be your recovery strategies, which are CNS modulation and kind of local stimulation. The goal on reducing inflammation, reducing muscle damage. Real picture is here's player perception of soreness when you look into these studies. So cold water immersion, contrast therapy, compression garments, the intermittent pneumatic compression and massage. Um, I, I think in some groups there's this like, well, that's, that stuff doesn't really work. That's not important. More load feels better. We're still, if we ignore this and kind of what our patient's belief and satisfaction are with their care, we're probably gonna miss some of their pain. So if we can address this stuff, address their beliefs and their expectations, again, we're just down-regulating the nervous system. Down-regulation of the nervous system is easy. Put me in a dark room and give me a 30-minute massage. I'm going to feel a little bit better. It's not the whole picture, but it's a little piece of it. The next one's nutrition. I'm not going to dive too far into this because I feel like I'm going to make some people angry if they have strong nutritional beliefs. Uh, for our system, I will say we believe in just a really balanced diet that concentrates on caloric intake versus expenditure. Uh, and that balance is important to make sure that you're getting all the nutrients you need. We know fish oils decrease inflammation in the system, vitamin D and calcium. If the bones and muscle system isn't strong, we have an increased likelihood for injury, increased likelihood for pain perception, and then recovery there is huge. If our guys aren't getting good food in, acute to chronic workload ratio doesn't matter. It makes no difference if your guys eating Big Macs all the time and their inflammatory markers are through the roof. The next one's sleep. I saw somebody else is doing a presentation on sleep, so I won't, again, I'm not gonna go too far into it, but this is huge. We know that athletes that are getting less than eight hours of sleep can be at a double risk of injury, which is sky high. Uh, and then people in chronic pain are running almost an hour deficit every single night in sleep. So they're sleeping much more often kind of four to six hours instead of that six to eight hour window. It's a chicken or the egg conversation. Do they sleeping bad and that's why they're having pain or is it their pain that's causing them to sleep bad? I don't care. I'll be totally honest with you. Sleep hygiene's huge here, right? Is it, are they staying on their phone? Like a lot of our athletes are in bed for an hour and a half with the TV blasting. They say, well, I can't sleep. Yeah, no duh, right? Cool down their room, try and get them off their cell phones early or at least educate them. Uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about passive education, just putting stuff in, the, in your locker room, in your training room, on sleep hygiene without hammering your guys may be a decent strategy so they start getting it from elsewhere. Having leaders in your locker room makes a big difference on this one too. But doing everything you can for sleep hygiene, whether that's changing your travel schedule, talking to them about hotel rooms, cooling them off. I think again, this, nutrition, and education to me are my three big pieces. I think if we're missing these, a lot of what we're doing, data analytics, data collection wise, probably doesn't make a big difference. Uh, so therapeutic neuroscience education is a really long term for teach people about pain and they feel better. CNS modulation again, right? It decreases the threat level on the system by people understanding what's happening with their body. So as we get back to this, this graph here, if we change their expectations and their belief and their knowledge, the output, the pain, the motor output, the down regulation, all changes with it. So this is huge. Also the language that we use with our patients is really big. This is been a huge push in the research recently. Don't use tear, don't use ruptured disc, right? Find better words or don't use, you know, you have a degenerative knee. 
Most of my athletes went to college for a year. And by went to college, they went to class for like two months to stay eligible, declared for the draft, and then came to me. If I say degenerative, bulge, disc, they have no idea what I'm talking about, right? And there's normal age-related changes that happen in the system anyway. If we look at individuals from 35 to 70 years old, we find all sorts of stuff in their spine. If we ask them all about pain, it has no effect. There's people who have completely clear x-rays and MRIs, high levels of pain. People who look like they shouldn't be walking, should have thrown one of them in there. There's some MRIs that have full spinal cord compression and people are walking around just fine. So there's more that goes into it. Try to watch your language around your athletes because most of them probably won't understand you if you start pushing it really far. Uh, this is from a journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. It came out like two weeks ago. If anybody wants this, I've got it for you. I think it's a great chart. Any questions? I went way faster than I thought I was going to. Did, did you request with the, uh, or I guess with uh, work experience or your research or, or any of that with uh, the military population? Because you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So my uh, some of my residency training was with active duty military and special forces, uh, and then during my fellowship, I had the opportunity to work out with Second Battalion Rangers for a few weeks uh, at Fort Lewis. There's a lot that goes in with these guys, and I think they're really interesting. They're interesting case studies when it comes to pain. Their stories. Do we have anybody that works with active duty or SF in the room? Yes, yeah, so we've got a handful of you. Um, you guys have all heard the stories then. A guy gets shot in the field, but their buddy's more wounded than they are. They get off the field, they don't even realize they've been shot, right? Or a blast injury, and they're required to do whatever they can to get back and get exfilled out of there, right? That makes a big difference. So their perception is very different. And then when they come back, we look at PTSD, kind of the chronic regional pain syndromes, fibromyalgia. That's very prevalent in that population. Uh, and some of it's because of the trauma they went through at their time of the injury. Even if they've healed all the way, there's still some really negative, high-level central stimulation that goes with that injury. So I think this is where having a sports psychologist, having them see right, a psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, kind of whatever your preference is, but getting them into those people who can talk to them about it, we see a downregulation in the nervous system. We see a downregulation of pain at that point. So I think it's a great question. It's probably an underserved community there, too. Mm -hmm. um, some athletes try to do it really fast, others take a lot of time. What are some of the, like from your perspective, what kind of risks or best practices that you look at? Yeah, I think monitoring load there is huge. Um, and again, leaning on maybe a psychiatrist, psychologist for what is the mental side that goes with that, right? There's, that oftentimes is a traumatic injury where there's probably some backside stuff that I'm certainly not qualified to deal with, but on the load monitoring side of, you know, strength testing, range of motion, if we're thinking uh, kind of more wheelchair-based athletes, what is their shoulder range of motion? What's their thoracic range of motion? How are they compensating elsewhere in the system? And then living in that workload ratio, finding that proper one for your guys. So we're not overloading them, but we're starting slow, build up, build up, and then we can hammer on them eventually. But I think we need to be smart about kind of that progression. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, I'm curious about how uh, analgesics fit into um, is that. Um, I've, I've got a little bit. Uh, yeah, just in terms of how it, like, I, I guess, A, where, whether they, they should be avoided in terms of um, allowing the natural mechanism mm -hmm. to yeah, so they're... Just adjust your perception of where they're at and what the interpreter has heard. How, how, do, how do you think of that? So I think there, there's times it can make sense, right? Post-surgical, if we can assist the body uh, in regulating that stimulation or down-regulating pain, I think it makes sense. There's a lot of research on where certain drugs, whether it's kind of like opiates or affecting the system and what's the appropriate dosage. Um, so I think in an acute injury, Dosing that, working with your physicians to then properly pull them off of it and not just kind of take that away. We know there's a big opioid academic or epidemic kind of throughout 
America, I imagine some of that's kind of trickled up here as well. So working with your doctors to properly prescribe that on the front side and then wean them off of it. And then eventually if we, there's kind of opioid induced hyperalgesia. So it actually is the more opioids we give somebody, the more pain they have, uh, which is a really interesting concept that even, you know, some prescribers aren't aware of. Uh, and I think it's important to note that if we track it, we give them more opioids, we increase their milligram dosage and it goes away or their pain goes up. The reason is, is because their natural system starts to shut down. So the body can actually produce all of these chemicals on its own. But as we give it more, the body's like, oh, I can be lazy. I don't need to. Um, so I think there's a time and a place. Yeah. And if you're, if you're interested in the study or anybody's interested in that, I've got a couple of those that I can kind of send out. Anybody else? Cool. Thanks, guys.